welcome everyone. Uh, we certainly appreciate your time to uh, come out today. And of course, this is the uh, Internet of Things meets the factory floor event. Again, my name is Matthew Thornton. I work directly for Siemens Factory Automation here on the West Coast. Um, and we think this is a really interesting uh, pre-event to the event. Uh, you'll see what I mean here in a few moments. Before we get started, though, just a quick show of hands. Who here has some kind of intelligent device with them right now on them? Just a quick show of hands. Is there anybody here who does not have something on them that's intelligent and connected? Come on, don't be shy. So literally 100% of us are connected right now. That kind of sets the tone, right? Everybody's connected now. Well, the whole idea of, of this keynote is to impress upon you uh, technologies that we can start utilizing to give you competitive edge. The sheer fact that you're all connected in your personal lives is kind of case in point to what's occurred in the commercial and retail markets, right? It's incredible what's occurred over the past uh, 10 years, basically. Um, before I get started, though, just real quick, uh, sometimes I'm referred to as the mouth of the South, so when I get going, uh, you'll hear a little bit of a Southern German accent. I'm a Siemens employee, right? Uh, you know, just bear with me, raise your hand, tell me to slow down, whatever the case may be, and uh, I'll certainly try to make certain that uh, I don't run ahead too fast. Um, Siemens takes this whole concept of what's occurred in the retail and commercial markets very seriously. We've made significant investments into the software and the hardware of the automation architecture for us. So let me give you a couple of examples of that. Uh, over the past seven or so years, we've invested somewhere in the neighborhood of about 4 billion euros into, into product lifecycle management software businesses, uh, design software. Now, the reason that's pretty important is because we're trying ultimately to tie the design world to the production world. And essentially, if you imagine this, if we can actually help you design even something like this iPhone, for instance, right? If the 3D model of this design is a common data thread all the way through virtual testing, virtual manufacturing, all the way through actual production, with a common feedback loop for quality control that could dramatically compress your time to market for a device. Because if you don't have to spare at software systems, first off, you don't have to worry about having some kind of error in the data, right? Who here has ever imported or exported data and never had one single bit shift ever in their entire life? Anybody? No, nobody's ever done that. Right? It's, it's, it's nearly impossible, right? So the whole concept of us acquiring all these software companies is to create a device that's designed as if it's the internet of things in all the different processes it takes from design to production. That's the whole concept. And compress the time to market so that you, know, you can beat your competitors. Another good example would be uh, the hardware. The new automation architecture that's sitting in front of you on these test stands that you see. So we've made significant investments in the new arch architecture as well. So here's a good example. We've added in a lot of system functionality. And what I mean by system functionality is we're actually burning certain functionality into the firmware of the hardware devices. Has anybody here heard of TIA before from Siemens guys? Okay, so quite a few of them. The, the concept is being truly realized today more so than ever before with the new automation architecture. Reason being is because since these devices are designed from the ground up new since 2007 moving forward, we've been able to add stuff into it that we never had before in the old architecture. A good system function that's really interesting to show is system diagnostics. The diagnostics for the automation architecture today, the new stuff, is burnt to the firmware, like I said. Essentially, to get a high-low range on an analog car, get a wire break on a digital car, get an overload condition of a drive, you automatically get that, and not one line of code is required to accomplish that. So you can mitigate downtime very, very fast. In fact, we've even added in physical layer profinet diagnostics into the system functions. You don't have to code for that either. 
we can tell you within one meter of where Profinet's broken if a guy takes out a cable train. And not a single line of code is required to get that either. It just works. Trying to do stuff in the background so you don't have to, so that you're more efficient in your engineering and or production, right? Either which way, it doesn't matter. We're trying to help you find ways to be more efficient, more effective, and in essence, hope that you uh, make more money, right? That's the end goal for all of us, right? How can we make our company more money? How can we make more money, right? That's, the, that's why we're all here. That's why we all work. Okay, so back to the, the concept of the iPhone and everything. This is, this is regardless from an industry perspective, it doesn't really matter if you're talking about something like a you know, semiconductor production, it could be farming, it could be oil and gas, it could be automotive, but it simply doesn't matter what industry, because all of them are starting to use technologies just like this. And all of them can actually uh, utilize it to be much more productive. Um, did you guys realize, as of today, and this is, could already change because of the sheer ramp, as of today, the world population of adults, 50% have some kind of intelligent device on them right now. 50%. The rate, that, that the rate of increase of adoption of this into your personal life within five years will be 80% of the adult population. 80 it's incredible how much we're adopting this in our personal lives. All signs point to the fact that this is, no matter if it's happening in their personal lives, it's also going to be happening in our business lives for industrial automation. The same thing is going to occur. There's no question of that. It's just whether or not you're going to adopt it first. Um, and this is regardless of being just, let's say, iPhones and iPads and Androids. It's also wearables. It's also implantable devices. It's also industrial automation devices. It's anything and everything you could dream of. And the cool thing with all these different devices in our personal business lives is they're all producing data. All of them. Okay, so most recently I was working in Germany, in Nuremberg. I worked there for three and a half years. I was the global marketing manager for the TIA portal. Uh, and they moved me from Germany to Portland. And so now I am your business developer for the whole western region. And of course, I had to fly down here a couple days ago from Portland, right? You guys realize how much data a single flight produces today? If we burn the data onto CDs and stack them up, it will be four stories tall for a single flight. It actually took two flights to get here on Sunday, so that's eight stories tall of data. It's incredible, just a flight. All right. Anybody here heard of the new cool Google dog toy called Petabyte? Anybody heard of this? It's really, really cool. I, I'm sorry. It's actually the latest craze at the nail salon for women. Anybody heard of the Petabyte? Anybody heard of this? All right. So this is the pronunciation of Petabyte. This is the next step above Terra. The funny thing is, outside of this room, if any one of you go ask your friends who are not engineers or industrial automation industry, what a billion really means. You know as well as I do, they don't understand how big that number is. Just the word a billion, the number, let alone what this means. So let's put this in perspective. It's one quadrillion bytes of information. It's a pretty big number. There's no doubt about it. Walmart currently has 25 petabytes of information in their database right now with one million transactions with customers per hour. It's an incredibly large database. Imagine if they could really leverage that to their advantage, which you know they are. There's no doubt from a pricing perspective and where to sell what when. Right? There's no question they're doing that already. All right. Let's put this into real terms. If you actually take 25 petabytes you turn that into seconds, it's 770 million years ago. That's one-sixth of the age of the planet. It's incredible, right? If you stack up bills from the Earth to the moon, it would go 7,100 times. They were all dollars. Very, very large numbers, right? And they're only going to increase. There's no question. 
we're talking about you know big data and Internet of Things. The funny thing is they're already impacting markets as we know it today. Case in point is this little guy right here, something called iTunes. It literally dramatically impacted the music industry as we know it, and it's still impacting it, right? It, it flipped it on its head, and nobody saw it coming. I got case in point in my pocket, right? Imagine what else is going to happen from industry perspective on entire industries. You know, disruptive technologies could literally blow up entire companies. There's no question. Kodak. Kodak had no idea this was coming either, right? Right here. They had no idea what this was going to do to them, taking pictures. I actually read an article that said there's more pictures taken per second with iPhone, just iPhone. Then there was film being produced for an entire year by Kodak. And they didn't see it coming. They had no idea this was going to change their, not change it, blow up their entire business, literally shut them down. So with disruptive technologies actually impacting markets, this also could be a massive competitive advantage to utilize. So if you look at, let's say, machine data today, the lines are being blurred between, let's say, the physical world and the virtual world, cyber physical systems, kind of what I was talking about with the, the design cycle going from 3D dimensional design through virtualization and testing all the way through production, right? Like a cyber physical system. You never actually do anything, but there's no physical models anymore. Not necessarily, it could be. But that could be a huge advantage for, let's say, uh, compressed time to market, right? You can find a way to leverage that yourself. Uh, you could have better shop floor optimization based off of the data you can get. More importantly, factory workers could be more informed to make better decisions on how to produce something. There's any number of ways that this can impact your top and bottom line and, again, make you more money. You've got to find a way to leverage it, though, right? That's the key. Okay, so what is this? How is it going to affect me? Is it secure? What's all the hype about? Will it work? And more importantly, why should I care? Right? That's what you're really asking yourself. And or will the southern boy go back to the south, right? All right, so let's take a very brief look back in time. The flux capacitor can do amazing things. So let's see what we can go see. Internet, as we know it and use it today, 1991, basically, right? Something very important after that was Wi-Fi. So what did we do before that? You guys remember going to Blockbuster and actually thumbing through VHS tapes, right? Tower records. There's very few of these left in the world. I'm an audiophile. I love to still flip through albums, still collect them. Maps. Not only did you have a paper map, you had to be able to navigate it and understand and read it. Now with this guy right here, you don't have to know anything. You just punch it in. It tells you where to go. Do what? Yeah, absolutely. The funny thing is, I bet you money, the vast majority of the planet, you gave them a compass and a map and told them to go from point A to point B, they would not get there. I'd bet on it. Right? There's no question. Probably quite a few people in this room that would. But we have a different perspective on the world and how we do things, right? Wish book from Sears. That was really cool. I don't know if you guys dug this, but I really thought this was great when it came out. Yeah ripping pages out, showing my parents. You had to write checks for everything. You actually had to mail letters to your friends. That's completely gone, right? Outside of wedding announcements and or your kids graduating, that's the only reason to actually send a letter to somebody of some sort, right? All the practical purposes, is it's gone. Something very cool occurred before all this, though, right? I'm sure everybody had one of these $4,000 Motorola's, right? Quick show of hands. Right? There's a handful of you. Wow, cool. <laughs> of course, being really commercially viable was, you know, in reality was, was the 90s from a business perspective. The sheer, the sheer number of cell phones that were populated by that point in time. I had an analog Nokia. I had a digital Nokia. In fact, I had that 
digital mail kit right there. 200 standby hours, by the way. That's incredible, right? This has a Mophie on it. Barely lasts 12 hours. <laughs> 200 hours. Incredible, right? 2007, June 28th. Pretty important date for Nokia. They didn't see something coming. You guys know what it was? The very next day, June 29th, what occurred? Somebody knows. iPhone was announced. Pretty interesting character that could really sell anything very well on stage, right? There is an iPhone effect that we're all experiencing today. There's no doubt. Okay, I got to personally experience this myself. So when I was in Germany, we had our first daughter. And before she turned two, uh, she could play Angry Birds. Of course, she would always shoot at the ground, the ground, right? She could take pictures, and she could thumb through pictures or swipe through them. And at one party, uh, she was uh, one year and I think uh, nine months, there was a friend that had an Android, and so she wanted to play with it. She wanted to see what she could do. And she could not figure it out as fast as she could do with this. She gave it back to the guy and went and asked for another iPhone. Right? It is really that simple. There's no question, right? And the cool thing was, several months later, there was another party we had, because I'm a typical American. I grill in the snowing, it's raining. The Germans think I'm crazy. Right? That's cool, though. And she was showing different capabilities of the phone, iPhone, that we didn't know. multi -touch. And there were several Germans going, hey, look, check this out. Look what she can do. And she was, there was a little uh, baby TV she had. And then she knew there was a way to do a, a circle on the, the phone that would actually restart it and give the opportunity to go out of that video for baby TV. And nobody in that, nobody knew that. Everybody's like, wow, that's cool. I've never seen that multi-touch functionality. She figured it out. She was only two. All right? Okay, it's not just kids. It's also, you know, Uber tech geeks like me and all of us, right? This is actually pretty cool what this guy can do, depending on how you're utilizing it. Also, elderly, it's pretty simple for them too, and people that have uh, vision or hearing impairment. Based off of applications, this could actually, for somebody who can't see, they can use Zeri, right? They don't have to be able to see it. They can still use it and be very effective with it too. It's pretty cool, huh? There's an app for that. 1.2 million apps as of, I think, three weeks ago. And something very significant occurred back in June. Does anybody know what that was? The App Store for Apple? Anyone? 100 million, excuse me, 100 billion downloads. So the cool thing, if you think about it, is the sheer fact that we have software and hardware that can work together and do things for you enable the GPS for the app so that the app can do exactly what it's supposed to, right? It did something in the background and changed the functional capability of your device for you so that you could do something. There's an app for that, right? It's pretty cool what they can do. Twenty-four seven connectivity. So like I said, we just moved from Germany to uh, Portland, actually Lake Oswego, just south of Portland, and my wife joined the Portland Mothers Club, and she's now on the board of the Portland Mothers Club. And on the Facebook page, before we go to bed, she's on that Facebook page answering questions. When she wakes up, she picks up the phone, and she's on Facebook for the Mothers Club. She is connected. Outside of sleeping, she's connected 24-7. Of course, with medical, that's going to change, or is changing. If you have something implanted that's connected, you are connected 24-7. Literally, not figuratively, right? That's going to change even more and more and more as we go into the near-term future. The fact that it created an entire industry. Thank goodness that Samsung, and Google, and Microsoft, Google, not, uh, Nokia, right? They're all full tilt into it with all kinds of devices and, and pads and phones, right? Which makes it more interesting. There's certain things that some of them do better than others. And we'll get into that in a few moments. The whole fact that it created a whole cottage industry, a very large cottage industry. <clears throat> in 2008, right here, if you look at the sheer number of connected devices versus the population, the volume of people that were connected within a year of this launching, 24-7, basically, is 
So what we're really saying is for our purposes, what the birth of Internet of Things really is because of this guy right here. And of course, Android very soon thereafter, right? But look at over here. 7.6 billion versus 50 billion connected devices by 2020. 2015, that's five years from now. That's incredible. Unbelievable, actually. Okay, I'm not going to read the definition. It's pretty simple. We all know what it is. Some kind of electronic device that has some kind of connectivity capability to computer-based systems, right? That's what we're talking about. Now, for our purposes in the industrial automation world, how can we leverage more intelligent devices in our architecture, right? And if they are more intelligent, that means they could do more for us, which means we could do automation tasks much faster of some sort, right? Depending if you're talking about the power process or something very simple. Now look at that hockey stick. That's incredible. I mean, the exponential growth is absolutely amazing, in fact. So if you look at the PCs, you can see that's really not doing a whole heck of a lot as compared to the growth of smartphones, tablets, other stuff, and things that are coming very soon. I mean, the exponential, growth, exponential rate of growth is, is phenomenal. There's no doubt about it. Okay, Carnegie Mellon, back in the 80s, in reality, invented this already with Coke machines. So they created an, a network architecture for Coke machines to know exactly how many Cokes and Sprites and Diet Cokes were in a machine. Also, how much money was in there, because it was all essentially coin-operated. There were some bill-operated machines back then, but much more coin, right? And also, uh, to know what's going on with the compressor. And then it kind of withered away. Now, stuff you may not know about. Did you guys realize that Google's working with Levi's to, wear, to make wearable jeans that are connected? So, so imagine this, this is the concept, is that if you had a specific jacket, and these are Levi's I have on right now, so based off of a seam over a seam, if you swipe it, it would do something different with your, your phone or your watch or whatever. You could turn your phone on, turn it off, make it louder, you could answer a call, whatever. So a guy, the very first event we had in, in Napa, he says, that would be awesome because I ride motorcycles most of the time. I don't have to fiddle with anything. If I got Bluetooth up to my helmet, I could answer my phone just you know, like that. I was like, yeah, that's right. It's a pretty cool idea, isn't it? This Scully helmet's pretty cool. So there's actually a rear-facing camera here, and there's a heads-up display, so there's no blind spots for motorcycles anymore, which is kind of cool. However, it's also connected uh, via Bluetooth for anything and everything you're doing from your phone, as well as streaming music simultaneously with a heads-up display to help communicate. There's no wires attached, just Bluetooth. Kind of a cool idea. So from Greek mythology, these are the new flying shoes. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so these shoes actually directly tie into Google Maps. And for runners, especially people that travel a lot, if you go to, say, a new city, and you're going to do a 10K that morning, you map it out, you sync that with your shoes, and then you start running, and whenever you get up to a corner, it will vibrate which way you need to go, left, right, or straight. So you never have to look at your phone. Crazy. Even shoes are connected, right? Fitbit. Is there anybody here who's got a Fitbit on right now? Anybody got a Garmin on? So just a couple of Fitbits. So let's say I believe there's approximately eight sensors in a Fitbit right now. It would not surprise me if virtually all watches at some point will have you know, sensors integrated into them to give you information about yourself, right? Diagnostics about your blood pressure or whatever, right? But the interesting thing is that they can actually already tie these to certain things, certain objects, like this cookie jar. If you don't meet your fitness standard, the cookie jar does not unlock. Now, some guys said, well, yeah, that's okay. I'll just hit it with a sledgehammer and I'll get into it. I said, yeah, but if it's glass, you're not going to eat it now. Right? You break it, that's it. The cookies are worthless. I'm not going to eat them. I promise you that. Okay, so aside from the fitness world, which is obviously going to be much more prevalent uh, every year it goes by, the medical world is going to be where we're going to see 
incredible advances into wearables or implantables. This is a Google lens uh, for measuring glucose levels in your tears so that diabetics don't have to prick their finger anymore. And it will sync with a watch or a phone or whatever. One lady two shows ago said that's, that's genius because then you could tie that to a pump and then they would never have to inject themselves in. So everything would be totally autonomous. It would just work all the time. You put your lens in the morning, the system would regulate. If it needs to give you an um, insulin shot, it does. If it doesn't, you're good. Now, <clears throat> this is just a wearable. What's coming in mass form is implantables and other wearables. So let me give you an example. There's a guy that we work with back up in Portland at a distribution uh, company, and he had a pretty severe heart attack and they had him put on a wearable uh, defib jacket. They were on a boat, he's not supposed to drive, but they were on a boat fishing, and all, thing, all of a sudden they're all sitting there, and it's pretty calm and quiet, and they hear it charging. <laughs> the guys scatter, they all, he's like, oh, he couldn't take it off, it's locked on, you can't take this thing off. He thought he was about to get defib right there on the spot. They had considered, though, before they put that wearable on, was they were gonna implant that onto his heart. They can already implant defib directly on your heart right now. Now that's just one of many things they can do It's coming. To take that even a step further would be uh, Princeton University's uh, nano robotic technology. They're already testing nano robots that they would inject to go do mechanical surgery inside to be as less invasive as possible. I know they're testing that right now. So this is going to be pretty interesting what's going to occur in the medical world. Now, if you look at just monitoring, there's no question it's easy to have people connected right now. Uh, you know, a perfect example, if you were elderly and you had an issue but you had no significant other anymore, it sure would be nice if you were connected all night and they could monitor you remotely, right? Because nobody else is going to help you. Now, I just had a, a daughter when we moved here. She was a micro pre and we brought her home, she was on a monitor for about five, six months after we brought her home. She was connected all the time. Now, it was also to help wake her up. Uh, she quit breathing, but she was connected so they could actually read all the data and what's going on with her the whole time. So I got to personally experience that as well just uh, several months ago. Okay, sports science. You can't fake this basketball from Wilson. You can't convince yourself it's your great jump shot from the left side of the court. Is this going to monitor every single shot you make, every single pass you make, and it's going to tell you exactly how bad you really are. And that's what you got to work on. So this is out right now. This helmet, I can promise you this will be used in pro and college football, I guarantee it, next year. So they've got this shock box that's connected with sensors into the helmet. And the helmet itself is connected back to the sideline, the coaching staff. And based off of the, the energy received in the hit, right, they can actually tell immediately if that was enough for a concussion. They'll know before the guy even gets up off the ground. And at that point, he's off the field, right? And I guess the idea makes a lot of sense because if they already know, he can't try to you know, wave it off, say, no, I'm good, and keep on trying to play. And then they go, oh, wait a second. They can tell after the first play. No, he really is. He's got a concussion, right? Okay, these Gatorade bottles. So Gatorade teamed up with um, Brazilian national soccer team in the World Cup a couple of years ago. Of course, it didn't help because Germany crushed them in the World Cup. It was embarrassing. I think it was the worst, it was the worst match for Brazil in their history. Because I think at one point it was five nothing. I think they finally scored one goal, uh, so it actually didn't help them at all. But it has nothing to do with their play; it has everything to do with their hydration. So everybody's tied to a certain number of water bottles, and they know your hydration level for those water bottles, and whether or not you're coming over there periodically to get a drink. They know whether or not you're properly hydrated during that match. So even water bottles are connected. It's incredible, right? Okay, cars. Now, regardless that you know Tesla's pretty cool, considering what we do for a living, and we know that we can 
even build something even cooler than this. You know, we could build a car that you couldn't keep rubber on the tires, right? Electric motors, DC mag, and within five seconds, there'd be no rubber, right? Be no problem, we could do this. But regardless of being a cool idea, really cool idea, the fact that it's connected is even cooler. So he's constantly being monitored real time on performance. And he can actually have live firmware updates to help increase the performance any point in time. That's a pretty cool idea, right? Uber. You guys realize this is the largest taxi cab, taxi cab company in the world, and they don't own a single cab, not one. Now, here's the really interesting thing that you may not realize. You realize that it's bi-directional on rating. If you treat them like crap, you get rated just like you rate them. And if you keep on doing that, at some point, they're not going to pick you up. Because they're going to see that guy in red, and they'll see other people in green. What would you do, right? Goober. Now we're getting into the Jetsons, right? Autonomous cars, autonomous taxis. Um, I think it's really, really cool from one very simple perspective, considering what most of us do for a living. Imagine all cars were autonomous and essentially AGVs, right? We could easily, in this room, write algorithms so that traffic, the actual congestion of traffic, would go away completely. The real, real issue of congestion of traffic is the fact that there's human error in it, right? One guy taps the brakes with a lot of other people in front of him. There you go, you got traffic jam. Guaranteed. It's always human error. We could easily write an algorithm in this room. I promise, there's no doubt. I, I guarantee there's guys on here out writing algorithms right now that say, yep, no problem, gone. You'll never see a traffic jam ever again, right? Now, the other thing that was really cool was three shows ago, a guy mentioned, he says, hey, did you ever think about this? That means nobody gets a DUI anymore. I was like, that's actually kind of a cool thought because nobody has to be a DD anymore. So everybody can go out and party. It's like, oh, it's kind of cool. Didn't think about that, but hey, whatever. Internet of home. Did you realize that there's 800 million televisions connected right now and increasing at a rapid rate? That's just television. Nest. They only sold 250,000 units in 2014. Google paid, what, $3.2 billion for them. If they went on sharks, they would not have evaluated that high for 250,000 units. They would have gotten a couple million dollars, right? But Google knows something. They know the sheer volume of homes, not just from the, uh, let's say, the air condition or heat and air. They know that everything eventually is going to be connected and smart. There's no question. It's just a matter of time. Not if, it's when. Especially if you look at the security side of it, right? I've got quite a few. I mean, I'm a Uber geek. They call me a high-tech redneck, typically. Um, but I've got lots of friends that are, too. And they like to do everything they possibly can to their house. Using a controller to control your house, I have friends that do that. I'm going down that path myself. Why not, right? I know how to do it. It's not a big deal. Help me a security company help me do it. I can do it better than they can. It's what we do for them, right? Well. Good friend of mine, he decided to put the electronic keypad uh, on his front door. And his two kids have different codes. That way, when they come home to the front door, he knows exactly when they got there. He also put a camera on the inside so he could see for a fact when they walked through the door that you know, everything was cool. That was them. Uh, he gave me a really good example, too, that he tied it into uh, his phone system, especially if 911 was ever dialed. And there was 911 call hang up, 911 call hang up, and it came up on his iPhone twice. He just happened to be at the grocery store on a weekend, and he drove the house, and the cops were sitting there. He told him, he says, what happened? He says, we had two 911 hang ups. He says, well, can you please, he knew both kids were home, his daughter and his son were home. He said, can you please give them some grief and teach them a little lesson here? Because if they don't fess up, I want you to kind of press them a little bit and say, you know, why'd you do that? You know, just scare them. But it's still cool, right, because he knew exactly what's going on. He could have been 3,000 miles away and still know what's going on. Another idea, uh, something that he had a, a friend coming over that was a contractor, was going to do some painting. And he said, they said, well, can I have a key? He said, you don't need a key. He said, just show up at my door and call me. And remotely, he was with me in a different city, and 
he got the call. He says, all right, open the door. He went to the video, and, and he started talking to her. Said, it was a lady who was going to do some painting in his house. Said, that's a, that's a really cool, it's like a concert t-shirt that was red or something. And he started mentioning something about her shirt. She goes, how do you see me? He goes, well, you're looking right at a camera. You don't even know that, do you? So imagine, you know, that makes lives a lot easier. You don't have a lockbox anymore. You know exactly who's in your house that second. The idea that homes will become more intelligent themselves, right? From an energy uses perspective, there's no doubt that's, that has to occur. Hopefully, we can all make our homes more energy efficient by themselves, but we can certainly very easily make them more intelligent so that they use less energy. The perfect example is Bill Gates' homes, right? They have RFID sewn into the clothing. If you walk through any one of the rooms, you go through the door, it already knows that's you. Here's how cold you like it. Here's the music you like. Here's the light you like. If you leave the room, it all shuts off. Internet of cities. So, of course, the example I was giving about the Goober or the autonomous cars, right? Imagine if there was no real congestion all around the entire San Francisco Bay Area, right? Algorithms, we could create that. Like I said, there's no question we could. In this room, easily. Right now, do you guys realize certain cities across the nation, you already have apps that tie into the meter that will reserve that meter for you closest to the place you want to go. As opposed to you just circulating all over big cities and going down a, a bunch of one-way streets and getting mad and frustrated because you can't find a parking spot, right? <clears throat> Smart meters. You know, lots of light and gas companies are installing these as well. That way you can make a more informed decision uh, about your usage of energy at your house, right? The best example I can give is right now, Android right now, I have several friends that have it and we're sitting at some conference talking to some customers or a meeting or whatever, and all of a sudden the Android comes up and says, you need to leave now to, to make your flight, right? It already knows the traffic and what time his flight schedule and how far away he is. Right? That happens. That's right now, this very moment. So imagine even a more um, incredible experience of going into a city from far away. If you have to get up at a certain time to beat the traffic in order to catch the right ferry, in order to get to the light rail or bus inside of the inner city to get to an appointment, right? Well, if they can do all those things for you and the city's connected and you don't miss any of them, you're exactly where you need to be when you need to get it. All right. Joint Strike Fighter. So let me give you a little story about this guy before I talk about the real thing. Um, so it's kind of interesting. This was one of the last projects I worked on before I left uh, to go to Germany. So Dobbins Air Force Base down in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, they, they built a Rafter and the J-35 physically there. Of course, they built it in many other spots around the nation. But the interesting thing was is they actually build the J-35 vertically instead of horizontally. So the Rafter is built flying in formation. And the J-35 is on a giant AGV, and the AGV moves into tools, they do their work, they move into tools, they do their work. They shrunk the footprint of the J-35 fuselage down to one-tenth of the rafter, one-tenth of the side. The cool thing was we created a wireless architecture inside the factory of Lockheed Martin, and the AGV, of course, is autonomous. It's a functional safety over wireless for it. Um, so we actually created the AGVs for J-35s, the Internet of Things itself, just the fuselage build. Now, the reason this is up is because we're talking about this helmet. This helmet is $400,000. Anybody here seen uh, Iron Man, Tony Stark? Anybody? Anyone? So the heads-up display, if you've ever seen that movie, inside, him interacting with the computer-based system is seamless. There's six cameras around the J-35, and they're all a Internet of Things to that helmet on the heads of the split. If he tells the helmet to look backwards, even though he's flying forward, he will see backwards. If he just looks down, he'll see straight to the fuselage, and he'll see the earth beneath him. If he looks sideways at, at a left or right down angle, he'll see right through the, the body of the plane as well, or the wing, or whatever. There's no blind spots for him at all. He's always connected through the helmet directly to Joint Strike Command. 
One of the cool things about the J35, though, is you know, it's supposed to be multifaceted all in one plane. It's not just stealth. It's not just the ability to be an interceptor, a bomber. It's not just reconnaissance. It's everything all the time. So imagine the guy was going on a bomb raid, and all of a sudden he looked down and saw something suspicious, zoomed in through the helmet, told the camera to zoom in, and started turning himself instantly into a reconnaissance mission, and then kept on going and did his bomb run. That's the whole point. On the fly, do whatever you need to do, unintended on the fly. Yeah. Right? Pretty cool. All right, the big happy cow. So first, though, let's, let's start on the, on the uh, left side. You guys notice something very interesting about those trucks carrying the container? Come on, say it louder. Yeah, there's, there's no real truck cab in there, right? They look very suspicious like a guided vehicle, right? This is a large Siemens project. This is the port in Hamburg, the largest port in all of Europe. And they have restrictions on how much bigger it can get, right? All of Europe is highly restricted, especially Western Europe. So they wanted Siemens to come help them figure out how they could optimize the footprint they already have. These AGVs running these containers around run 48 straight hours before they have to be charged. It's a super fast charge. It only takes, it's measured in minutes, not hours to recharge. The cool thing is, they never get sick, they never get divorced, they never stay up late because they're feeding their kid, they never have a bad day, they never take a break other than getting charged, and they always go where they're told. We got incredible optimization of the flow of containers to this port because of this architecture that we built, the wireless architecture working in conjunction with AGVs. And they have much more capacity than they ever have before. And it's always right, too, by the way. They don't have any errant containers going any direction it's not supposed to anymore. That's completely gone away. The cow. This is a Dutch company that's created implantables for cattle herds. Now, it's not just trying to know where the cattle is. It's also, more importantly, if a cow's sick or pregnant, when they need to actually go do something for that specific head on the, in the herd. That way, they're not having to tend to it, you know, 24/7, 365. He's got other stuff he's got to do, right? Especially large farms. The interesting thing is, each head of cattle produces 200 megabytes of information a year. Cows are producing information, data, 200 megabytes every year. Coor ice. So this kind of goes back to the Coca-Cola example. So. Um, this is a project that we worked on. It's a little brother of the 1500 CPU sitting in front of you, the 1200. It's the microcontroller. That's what's, that's what's inside of these Coor Ice machines. Uh, the pretty cool thing is they took a lot of electric mechanical uh, controls out and put an actual CPU inside with a cell modem. They created a network architecture called Ice Talk. So their own network architecture, a SCADA architecture is called Ice Talk. And they know everything about these systems. Control, diagnostics, um, and material from anywhere in the world. Uh, as you know, I mean, ice, ice manufacturing is much more complex than a compressor for a Coke machine. There's a lot more going on. And the materials required to produce ice, obviously, is a lot more as well, right? We were in Seattle with the guy who uh, created this architecture, and there was somebody vending a machine, and before the person could put all their money in, he dispensed the ice for free from 3,000 miles away. He knew everything about it. He can dispense it. He can do whatever he needs to do. And you can monitor all your systems from a web-based management tool. OK, so let me kind of speak in future terms. Um, I always preface this with the fact that um, I'm not, not a big, huge LeBron James fan, not necessarily a big Nike fan, but the sheer fact that there's a strong possibility he'll go back to the NBA playoffs is probably pretty high. And he's got a very large, lucrative Nike contract is the reason why I'm using this example. So the idea is, what if Nike was completely integrated from design through manufacture and automated, highly automated? If he was in the next 
NBA playoffs, game six, and they came out with this really crazy funky shoe, which they already do, right? They have, I think, uh, two years ago or three years ago, he had some shoe that was, uh, had rainbow fluorescing Nike shoe for him. It was a one-off. So they do this already. But what if when they do come out with that shoe in that game, the social media blows up and there's real demand for it? Like, wow, where do I get those? It's not just a one-off, is it, right? If Nike monitored that, that means by Friday morning they could be producing that shoe because they've already got the data to build the shoe. They already built it at least once. They could be producing all Friday morning, all Friday afternoon, all Friday night, all the way through Saturday morning and ship the shoes to select Nike stores all around the U.S. And then in the exact same social media, say, guess what? Go to the, these select stores, they'll have that shoe. Go buy it. Now, here's the reality. As of right now, Air Jordans, it takes 70 people to touch Air Jordans to make it. 70 individual people. All right, so yeah, that sounds kind of far-fetched, but we're actually already doing this with several companies. Let me give you a couple of examples. So Mercedes, they've already gone down this path with, with Siemens. So the entire design side is the PLM design through manufacturing. The first plant that we will see in the U.S. this way will be the new C-Class plant in outside of Birmingham, Alabama. So everything from design all the way through production will all be tied together. Everything. Completely comprehensive. Of course, their thoughts are from a production perspective, not necessarily from the design side, but production. If there's any errors in production and the line managers say, wait a second, this is this is not the right size. There's something wrong with it. This screw's not right. This whatever, right? That quality feedback loop from down at the shop floor goes straight back to the actual design guys to fix it as fast as they can. If they can't fix it, they can start trying to source it to fix the problem so they don't put a bunch of Mercedes out there and have issues. That's the last thing in the world Mercedes would want to do, right? They can't afford that, especially even now, right? Especially now. Um, Another really good example you can go see live in person, if you go to YouTube, um, the, the Mars uh, rovers, the, the, in fact, the lander and the rovers, uh, that entire thing, that was uh, well, JPL, if I'm not mistaken, right? And the entire design of the lander and the rovers was done in Siemens software. The problem that, that they had is that because there's a different gravity on Mars versus planet Earth, they could not test virtually anything on this on this planet. Different gravity is not going to be the same, right? There's four deployment systems, I believe, for that lander. And of course, because of different gravity, that's impossible to test that as well. So they use something called technomatic software to test that lander coming into the surface of Mars. The first time they actually tested it in real life was when they landed on Mars. You can see that video. Uh, and they actually have the 3D renderings of that deployment system, which is the Siemens software, and it's posted on YouTube. Go check that out. It's really, really cool. You'll see what I mean by the ability to virtually test anything. And essentially, um, especially in the automotive world, I've seen this in person too, they can actually take that software, build a robotic cell, take actual controllers sitting right in front of you, HMIs, drives, everything, and run real control architecture in a, in, against a virtual robotic cell and fully prove it out. They can actually go break the light curtain with their hand, their foot, whatever, system shuts down immediately. This is with functional safety into the virtual world cloud in real time. So not through OPC server. This is real time capable. Really, really cool. But you can really see that in that, um, that kind of functional capability with that large lander. Excuse me. A couple other companies that you know that are doing something like this. So Google Earth, I'm sure virtually everybody knows what I'm talking about, right? And Ford and Siemens uh, came together to work on a project. So InfoSight is what was created between the three companies. So it's pretty simple. Since you're using uh, Google Earth for all the plants of Ford around the world, if you have your smart device with you, you can actually go find, essentially, yourself at any production facility for Ford around the planet. So the example I give 
is imagine that there's multiple production sites producing the exact same car, which is the case. They don't just produce Ford Escorts in one Ford facility. They're produced in four or five facilities all around the world for those local markets. However, let's, let's say down in South America, one of those production lines is having issues with the air conditioning system, installing it properly. The best guy in the world is in Detroit. They could videotape him installing it, pin that to an escort production line, and then that would populate across the entire info site for all escort production. The line manager could come back down and he could see that pin, watch the video, and show all of the workers how to do it correctly at that factory and solve the problem within minutes. Now, it's not just for, let's say, quality control. It could be anything, anything in the production line. They could actually uh, virtually pin to it to solve any issues. If they found a manufacturing error of something, they could pin it to that car so everybody knows, nope, you can't use that bolt. you got to use this other bolt. Sorry, it is what it is. We were wrong, right? You know, in your BOM, you're supposed to do this. That's not right. That one's wrong. It's anything. Anything to make their lives much more efficient on the production floor. Let's show you this quick video, and uh, pretty interesting. So Intisight is a collaborative effort between Siemens and Google, and it uses the Google Earth infrastructure uh, to provide navigation techniques to scan through our different regions, enter our assembly plants right down to the level of the work cell, and see in 3D uh, different layers of content pertaining to that work cell. And it can be accessed by users all over the world uh, through an internet site uh, that you log into, and you can upload the content and access it there in one space. The way we're thinking of using it is there's a 2D map of the, of the plant. And over that 2D map, we can add 3D content. So things like standard dunnage bins, you know, the bins that hold the parts, conveyance systems, platforms, right down to the vehicle. Part of the real flexibility of the Intersight tool is that you can actually go down to the plant, you can bring a tablet or a smartphone, and you can film content, you can take photos, and then you can use QR codes, which are, are sort of like barcodes. They're stickers that you can adhere to a location within the plant. You can scan the code with your tablet or your smartphone. And then you can upload video or photos that you've taken to that location within the Intisight software. So immediately, users anywhere in the world can go to that work cell within Intisight and look at the content that you've uploaded. So I can say, show me every document that's been pinned within five meters of where I'm standing when I scan this QR code. And if I'm at a specific work cell, that can populate my, my smartphone or my tablet with PDFs of a schematic of this heater oven, or it can show me information about this dunnage bin. It can tell me how many parts are in it. It can tell me the weight of each part. I can look at the ergonomic analyses that were performed virtually, and I can compare them to how the job's currently being done to help identify why an issue may exist or why, why I've been called to this workstation. And to have this kind of tool where people can you know, see operations and how they're done in, in other regions, um, it has a lot of benefit. I mean, you can pin quality items or assembly processes that are critical to quality. They can be appended to these work cells. And we can use this potentially as a training technique for operators. Operators can go to the various work cells if they're assigned to a new work cell, and they can look at simulations of how the job is done. Documents can be pinned to that location that point out critical quality indicators. So there's all types of various use cases for this. And of course, having that standardization tool available to everybody, you know, it's going to help with quality for sure. Pretty cool, huh? Of course, that's the, the, the more of the macro view of what I'm talking about. Let me uh, kind of get into some of the, the micro of what could be directly impactful to us and what we do. Um, and of course, let me summarize this whole concept. Um, from a data perspective, the whole point of what we're trying to do ultimately with you is give you higher quality data so that you can be more effective, no matter if it's design or production or whatever. A very simple example of what we're doing now in the automation architecture side of this is single database concept. You create the database once for tags, your PLC tags, and populate that across all uses, HMI, SCADA, drives, everything. So if you change it in one spot, it auto-populates everything. 
as opposed to trying to maintain two databases in our architecture, which we all know the moment you're trying to maintain multiple databases on the exact same types of tags, unfortunately, it gives you a very high probability of error, right? And trying to deal with that. God forbid you actually do absolute addressing and you change something, right? Because at that point, that directly impacts everything from the HMI architecture instantly, right? So going to single tag or single database architecture in the new, in the new automation architecture uh, and also symbolic addressing, we're trying to help alleviate that concept completely. Um, the better the data, the more, uh, more informed decision that you can make and or the easier it is for you to work with it because it's a higher use case data application. Right? Again, trying to find ways to save you time and money. From the diagnostic perspective, what I was giving earlier, um, the whole concept is trying to help find ways so that you can mitigate downtime and guarantee a much better uptime of your production, right, or your machine. That's why we integrate system function diagnostics, and there is no software. So let me take that just one step further. Since it's a system function in our controllers, that means even if the CPUs are stopped, you still get the diagnostics across the entire architecture of the high-low range, of the wire break, of the drive and overload condition. Even if the CPU is in stop, we'll still populate that to the HMI or to the display on the 1500 or to the engineering tool or the web server. So before you even start the machine up, you'll know exactly what's wrong. That's what I mean by integrated system diagnostics. It has nothing to do with software. There's no software. Doesn't even, there's no software at all. It's all system. Try to make you more efficient, right? I'd be willing to bet that the vast majority of real errors that occur on machines actually occur during the startup. Because they didn't realize there was something really wrong. The float is stuck and the pump starts going full tilt. Unfortunately, it's probably too late, right? Something as simple as that, right? Um, so again, trying to find ways, hopefully save you time and money in the engineering and or in the production world, right? The actual functional side of it. Um, there's no question, though, that this wave of technology is coming. All, all indications point to it. There's no doubt about that. If, if you relate it back to our personal lives, again, you know, within five years, 80% of the adult population will have this. 80%. And we could leverage this technology to our best uh, abilities in our personal and business lives. We already have an app for the 1500 and 1200 where you could control our controllers with the app right now. Just for the CPU, it has nothing to do with the HMI architecture, right? I'm trying to give you tools to make you more efficient and utilize technology to your best uh, ability. Um, in, in, in Europe, they're calling this industry 4.0. Uh, the United States, I guess, smart manufacturing is typically used. Um, ultimately, the wave is coming. We're just trying to help give you um, a little bit more information so that you can help find the surfboard and ride that way, basically. Uh, again, we take this very seriously, uh, and we would love the opportunity to show you more if given the opportunity. Again, uh, I thank you for your time. Um, the next thing we're going to do is have a hardware overview from Bill, and then after that, I believe we're going to take a break. We have a lot of E&M and Siemens experts. Um, there's Everything, anything you could think of from architecture back there. I think there's even there's even power supply back there. It's got an RJ45 board on. Um, to show you how seriously we take this, we're even moving the power supply and being connected. Um, but all the experts are here. If there's any questions, don't hesitate to ask them during that break, and then we'll come back, and then they'll do the hands-on session. Again, thank you so much, and uh, I hope you have a fun time with hands-on.